I wanted to talk to you today again about the plight of farmers, of farming and of real food. It surprises me how little people are interested in food and I mention this many times in my videos and yet food of course is the number one thing that will eventually get us if we run out of food, if we put the wrong kind of food into our body we will eventually fall apart and that will be end of us. We can tell that there is a concerted war on farming at the moment in this country and around the world and it seems to me that it's, it's vital that we start this conversation with ordinary and everyday people because without them on our side, without them considering what it is that's being farmed, we haven't really got much of a hope. One of the things that I hear that the Labour Party want to do in the next budget is to make inheritance tax for farmers up to 50%. So in other words, they'll take 50% of a farm when a farmer dies and wants to hand it on to his children. That's, I mean, that's just outrageous. It's too much. Many farmers are talking about this and I hope this will wake farmers up to the tyranny that the government is pushing out. They probably know that because of what they have to do with DEFRA. And then you've got the National Trust who are pushing farmers, tenant farmers, off their land because they're doing the wrong kind of farming. They're doing organic farming or they're trying to raise good quality food, perhaps dairy herds or beef herds. And the dairy industry and the beef industry is, of course, under attack because of the net zero policies. And this, again, is abhorrent to me. And what the National Trust, it seems to be, doing is pushing these farmers off and growing trees or plants and as if that is the answer to everything. It's very difficult for tenant farmers, of course, to go against the landlord's wishes because the landlord can just push them off. And then where do they go? Especially those tenant farmers who've been farming for generations or many, many years and they know other, no other industry and trying to get back into farming somewhere else is not going to be very easy. And then, of course, you've got what they're doing in the skies. They're spraying the sky, they're poisoning the water so that the crops are not growing as productive as they once were. It's even been suggested to me that uh, the seeds that they're planting are not as good as they ought to be or the, uh, the TB tests, which are a bit like the PCR tests back in 2020, are hyped up to show results which may actually not be genuine. So there seems to be this war on farmers and they can do very little to combat it. And the other thing is that people seem still very content to go to the supermarkets and buy the nutrient-free food. If only they really understood what was being put into their food or what was being taken out in the processing part it would surely cause them alarm. But sometimes I look at ordinary everyday people and I throw my arms up and think, well, what can you do? Now, I've been going around doing talks at various places around the countryside and one of the questions I ask is to the audience, how many of you still go to the supermarket? And many of them say, well, I do, but I go to Waitrose as if that was any better than anywhere else. How many of them are actually supporting genuine farm shops? Not these shops that just buy in in bulk, but genuine farm shops that have animals or they source animals within the locali locality. Julia and I do. It's an effort to do this. It's more expensive. We only have one meal a day. We might have a piece of cheese or some nuts or, or something simple, a glass of raw milk or something in the interim time. But one meal of nutrient-full food, full of vitamins 
and all the things that our body needs is all that we need. Unless, of course, we're doing extreme physical labour and then perhaps we'll need two meals. We have to judge that for ourselves. I mentioned raw milk just now. There is huge demand now for raw milk. More and more people are understanding the significance of it. Some people are desperately trying to say that no, no, raw milk is not good for you for various different reasons. And hence we have pasteurization and worse, homogenization, which is really making the milk pretty much just like whitewash. And who wants to drink whitewash? I was at a, an event earlier today, a meeting, and I was offered oat milk. Well, I can really say that oat milk is not actually milk. It's not a natural product. Coconut has its own natural milk. That's fine. But oats, you have to process those oats to make the oats make some form of liquid, which they're calling milk, as they're doing with various other things. So that's not for me either. Raw milk or nothing. And on that, the lovely Julia and I are desperate now, and we're getting closer to it, of going into some form of farming ourselves. And we would like to have a dairy herd. We would like to farm. We would like to get out of the jurisdiction of this nonsense government. And we would like to have um, a beautiful, perhaps a Guernsey herd and, and milk them. And so we've been reading various books. I've got a book here, Dairy Farming, The Beautiful Way, published in 2014. It is American, but I think some of the uh, uh, facts that it comes up with and interesting things are quite relevant for a small herd. So if you're doing something, it's well worth a read. I just want to read you a small extract from this, if I may. And this is about raw milk, or real milk, as some people like to call it. The fresh whole milk that comes from a cow is a perfect human food. For millennia, people around the world have esteemed such fresh milk as a priceless asset to human health and well-being. Despite the efforts of industrial agro-business to demonize, demonize raw milk, there is a rising groundswell of public demand for real raw milk. Raw milk contains many enzymes that work to increase the digestibility of the milk itself. During pasteurization, these delicate enzymes are destroyed. The loss is a, sign, is a significant cause of so-called lactose intolerance. Raw milk contains lactase, an enzyme specifically designed to facilitate digestion of lactose. Raw milk is more digestible to a much larger number of people than its processed counterpart. The vitamin content of raw milk is superior to that of pasteurized milk. The reason is the heating milk causes the breakdown of many health-producing vitamins. While present in significant quantities in raw milk, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin B6 and vitamin B12 and vitamin D are all significantly reduced or destroyed completely during the process of pasteurization. The active microbes found in raw milk increase the absorption of many minerals, including iodine, iron and calcium. These and many other minerals require specific microbial associations to be properly, properly absorbed by the human digestive system. Raw milk delivers these minerals to our bodies in an an absorbable form, increasing the body's mineralization. It goes on, I won't read too much more, you get the drift, that raw milk is very important, as is the rest of the whole food structure. If we can get more farmers on the land, growing locally and seasonally, and persuade people to shun some of these large corporations that are processing food in a most, in my mind, inhumane way and making people dumber and unhealthy so that the pharmaceutical industry can continue to dish out expensive white pills, then we have achieved something. We could all do something, I'm absolutely convinced, if that we make the effort to support farmers. Farmers, like any time before, need our help. And although you may think that this is a step backwards to go back to smaller 
um, local seasonal farming, I think that actually we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater with this hugely industrialization of farming. And we need to return to something that is wholesome, holistic and beneficial to us, people who live in the towns and villages. And so we need to support the farmers and they then can support us. Thank you for listening.